Okay, so get ready for a pretty abrupt end to summer, like a real shock of unseasonably cold air. Yeah, it's uh, definitely more than just your average cool front hitting. Today we're diving deep into this early September 2025 polar outbreak forecast for North America. We've got all the articles, the research, the notes you shared, and uh, our mission is basically to unpack what's driving this really unusual weather, mm -hmm. what it means for you, and honestly why it's just a fascinating look at how complex these atmospheric systems really are. That's right. And the, uh, the headline event here is this significant, really remarkably early blast of polar air. It's expected right across Central and Eastern North America. So we're talking what? pretty cold? Oh yeah. Temperatures may be 10 to 25 degrees Fahrenheit below average, uh, especially in the upper Midwest, Great Lakes, conditions more like late September, maybe even pushing early October. It's quite a shift. Wow. Okay. So this isn't just like a cold snap at ground level then. When people hear polar vortex, what are we actually talking about here and how is its condition, you know, influencing this forecast? That's a really crucial distinction to make. Um, we're primarily focusing on the stratospheric polar vortex. And up high. Way up high. Yeah, this huge region, uh, super fast winds, incredibly cold air, like 15 to 50 kilometers above us. What's so interesting, uh, what's fascinating here is that it usually strengthens this time of year. Right. But meteorologists uh, like Mark Margavage are noting it's record week. And Paul Passlock over at AccuWeather, he says it's been slow to strengthen. So it's unstable, wobbling. Exactly. That instability way up high, it dramatically affects the jet stream down here in the troposphere, causes it to buckle. Think of it like um, a weakened dam, maybe. It creates this sort of clear path, a conduit for that frigid polar air to just spill south. Okay. And some even think, you know, powerful systems like Hurricane Aaron could be involved, sending energy upwards, disrupting it even more. So the weakness up in the stratosphere is key. That's the channel for the cold. But like you said, the atmosphere is complex. Are there other big factors playing into the specific setup? Oh, absolutely. That downward connection is it's fundamental. Rough. Yeah. Yeah. But it's uh, it's rarely just one thing. We're also seeing other big atmospheric patterns kind of fall into place. Like what? Well, this event has the classic fingerprint of negative Arctic Oscillation, the AO, and also the North Atlantic Oscillation, the NAO. Yeah. Basically, think of these as pressure patterns. When they go negative, it's like opening a gate. You get high pressure up in the Arctic and it actively pushes that cold air south. Ah. It really sets the stage for... Um, well, a relentless onslaught of cold fronts, basically. It sounds like a real dynamic interplay. And I saw something uh, a, about a negative QBO, quasi-biennial oscillation. What's that fit in? Good catch. Yeah, the QBO, it's um, it's essentially this pattern of winds way up in the stratosphere, over the equator. They reverse direction every couple of years or so. Yeah. When it's in this negative phase, like now, it sort of subtly weakens the polar vortex from below. Mm -hmm. Contributes to that underlying instability. Yeah. Makes it more prone to these uh, these disruptions. Okay, got it. Now, here's where it gets really interesting for you, especially thinking about seasonal forecasts. You probably know La Nina usually means warmer falls for a lot of the U.S. Right, yeah, that's the typical expectation. So how do we square that La Nina warmth versus this forecast for intense cold? It seems contradictory. This is a critical insight. Okay. And it really highlights the different time scales. The key here is that this powerful um, short term atmospheric event, this stratospheric vortex messing up, it's actually overriding the weaker, longer term La Nina signal for now. Ah, okay. Think of La Nina maybe as like a, a background hum, but this vortex disruption, it's a blaring horn right now. Okay. That makes sense. And that's why some of the computer models, the dynamical ones, are just screaming cold for early September. While the official long-range outlooks, which have to factor in that slower La Nina influence, might lean a bit warmer overall for the season. So for the specific early September window, the vortex wins out. Dominant influence, yeah. exactly. Okay, understanding the atmospheric forces is one thing, but let's bring it down to Earth. What, what does all this actually mean for us, you know, on the ground, region by region? Right. Well, the upper Midwest and Great Lakes think Minnesota, Wisconsin, Michigan, they look like the epicenter. They'll see the biggest departures, those 15 to 25 degrees below normal. Wow. Then the cold air spreads east. So uh, the northeast, eastern Canada, you're looking at a very abrupt end to summer humidity. Bang, gone. And the west. Totally different story west of the Rockies. Yeah. Warmer and drier conditions are likely to prevail there. Okay, and risks. You mentioned crops. Yes, that's the most critical risk, especially for the northern states. A significant chance of an early frost. We're talking potentially four to six weeks ahead of typical first freeze dates. Four to six weeks, that's huge. It is. 
And that could really hammer crops like corn and soybeans that aren't mature yet. Yeah. I mean, historically, you look back, there was a freeze in Youngstown, Ohio, August 29th, 1982. That shows how rare an early September event of this scale really is. Unbelievable. The Old Farmer's Almanac even mentioned the possibility of uh, early snow, hmm. upper Midwest, maybe Wisconsin, later in September. Snow in September. Okay, so this isn't just a flash in the pan then, is it? Sounds like it might be setting a tone. It very likely could be a precursor, yeah. This early cold might be signaling a, well, a colder, more dynamically active winter ahead for 2025, 2026, especially across the northern U.S. and southern Canada. So for you, the listener, it means the atmosphere seems primed for maybe more action this winter. That's the suggestion. The combination of this weak polar vortex state starting early, plus a developing La Nina. Historically, that combo boosts the probability of not just these cold outbreaks, but even those big events called sudden stratospheric warmings later in the season. Which can really scramble winter patterns. Exactly. Big disruptions. Okay, so this deep dive has really shown us that your early September cold snap, it's definitely no ordinary weather event. Not at all. It's the sophisticated dance of atmospheric forces, primarily driven by that record weak stratospheric polar vortex, really setting the stage for some dramatic changes. Mm -hmm. And this early September anomaly, it's just such a potent reminder, isn't it, of how interconnected and dynamic our global climate systems are, really pushes us to question our assumptions about what's typical for a season. So the final thought for you to chew on, uh -huh. how might understanding these complex, sometimes conflicting signals, like the vortex versus La Nina, actually help us better prepare for what the atmosphere might throw at us next? 